Hello, good afternoon, good night, good evening, good morning, wherever you are. Uh, today we have uh, uh, a very interesting uh, program and we will talk about uh, religious freedom and we will talk about uh, the role of uh, the American Jesuit uh, John Cartney Mary on, uh, and his influence on Vatican II Dignitatis Humane. So uh, the, the topics that we will touch today are really uh, of a, a very great interest and importance. Uh, of course, I will do this with uh, a panel uh, that will help me and will help you to understand more uh, about uh, this issue and to clarify some of our uh, doubts. So uh, I will start. Uh, we, uh, 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 forgive me if I read a little because uh, there are so many things and titles that uh, I I am afraid I will forget. But I will start with uh, Professor uh, Eduardo Echevarria, uh, that is uh, author of the book Pope Francis: The Legacy of Vatican II. Uh, I think uh, also there is a second edition of this book. If yes, if I'm correct. Then uh, we have uh, uh, David A. Wemhoff, that is author of a book that is really relevant for the uh, uh, today's debate, that is John, John Courtney Murray, Time, Life and the American Proposition, How the CIA's Doctrinal Warfare Program Changed the Catholic Church, published by Fidelity Press. And then uh, we have uh, uh, Jose Antonio Ureta, uh, scholar uh, from the TFP that is now in France, and that is the author of uh, the book Pope Francis Paradigm Shift, Continuity or Rupture in the Mission of the Church, an Assessment of His Pontificate's First Five Years. And of course, uh, as we were discussing before, uh, probably he should uh, uh, maybe update the book because now more time has passed. So uh, he should certainly say much more on his, uh, uh, on his uh, book. So I thank you uh, uh, everyone for your participation. And uh, I want to uh, start with uh, um, David uh, Wemhoff because uh, uh, I got his book. And uh, when I got his book, uh, I, I was uh, and, uh, not surprised, but I mean, uh, I can appreciate the, 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 the many pages of the book. It's almost 1,000 pages. So, so it means uh, you research a lot around uh, this book. So I want to ask you why you were... A prompt to write such a book, uh, what push you to get interested in this kind of topic? Uh, thank you, Dr. Porfiri. It all started with the pro-life movement. I got involved in the pro-life movement more than 20 years ago. And uh, one of the common recurring themes in the pro-life movement is this idea of right to life found in the Declaration of Independence. And so I started uh, thinking about that and reading, again, the foundational documents of the United States. I am a, a practicing attorney in private practice. So I started reading those documents. And then I came across the papal encyclicals, namely those of Leo XIII and Pius IX. And I read those and read those and read those of uh, Gregory XVI. And all of this just simply sang to me. And I started to realize that the American system of social organization as best contained in the Declaration of Independence and as best set forth in the First Amendment to the Constitution is really at odds with Catholic doctrine. But when you're in the pro-life movement, you're not told that. You're, you're told that basically it's all compatible. And so uh, as you do more homework, you do more research, you find out uh, that uh, something happened along the way. And so I started to do uh, additional research uh, to include seven years of work, looking at a number of different um, uh, a number of different archives around the country. I read about 500 books and magazines and, and uh, even interviewing a few individuals. And so that's how I came up with the book to try to understand what is Catholic doctrine when it comes to the proper organization of society, because that's that's ultimately what we're talking about. 
when you're talking about religious liberty, you're talking about the proper organization of society. And the Catholic Church is very definite on how you do that. And there was a big debate in the 1940s and 1950s and the 1960s. And that's what my book talks about, that big debate between the Catholics on one side and the Americanists on the other side. And John Courtney Murray was a Jesuit. He was an Americanist. Uh, he was a guy who was there to promote the American, Anglo-American uh, system of social organization, namely the constitutional system with the First Amendment and with Article 6, Clause 3. Uh, and so what uh, I found out was there was this big debate between Murray on one side, who's friends with the American elites, uh, and a debate was against uh, Father Connell, uh, Monsignor Fenton, and uh, Monsignor George Shea, essentially, and then some Spanish Jesuits on the other side, defending the Catholic view of society. This whole thing happened during the course of the Cold War. So you have to look at it in geopolitical terms. This was going on between 1945 and 1965. The USA had won the Second World War and was spreading around the world. And in a, in a couple of secret conferences that I was able to find uh, in the Library of Congress, there was actually a discussion of how to penetrate these societies for the purpose of Catholic, I mean, for the purpose of American capital to get in and to control those societies. Uh, and this is all documented. And so uh, the essential aspect of doing that was to make sure the Catholics were on board because the Catholics are in every single country almost. Uh, and they have a lot, of, uh, uh, a lot of influence. So if the Catholic church, which is a giant circulatory system can be turned into an asset of the American capitalists or the American plutocrats as I call them, then you've got a worldwide effort to reorder societies around the globe. And all this is in the context of the Soviet Union and Soviet communism being the big bogeyman. So that's it in a nutshell. Thank you, uh, Dr. Wemhoff, for your uh, introduction to our discussion. So I want to go to uh, uh, Professor Echevarria and ask him, um, so... Um, uh, Dr. Wemhoff say that uh, um, uh, John Courtney Mary want basically to advance the value of Americanism uh, through his own uh, uh, um, theological action. So what do you think about this? Uh, the microphone, the microphone. You need to unmute yeah. the microphone. Yes. I think I have a different perspective of John Courtney Murray on this on this matter. Uh, you know, in the if you go back to the term when the term Americanism was first used in the letter that Leo the Thirteenth wrote to uh, James Gibbons. Yes, that letter. Uh, yes, of course. It's, it's a letter that's critical of Americanism, where you have an adaptation or an accommodation of the Catholic faith and the Catholic Church to, to the American context. But Leo also makes a distinction uh, that Vatican I makes, uh, and also that John XXIII makes, and it, and it goes back to uh, Vincent of Lorenz, and that is the, the distinction between the propositional truths of faith and their uh, alternative uh, linguistic and conceptual formulations. But then you always have that the parenthetical, the, 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 the subordinate clause that when you formulate something in an alternative way, um, Vincent uh, states, Vatican I states, John the 23rd states, you can find it in in John Paul II, you, you can find it certainly in the last 150 years in many documents, and that is that the alternative formulation has to keep the same meaning and the same judgment. Because Vincent asks the question, is that so in the fifth, he's a fifth century monk, commonatorium, and he asks the question, is there no progress in religion? And then he distinguishes progress from change. Change is when one thing uh, becomes something else. Uh, progress, he says, uh, of course there's progress. Of course there's a deepening in our understanding of the propositional truths of faith as individuals and as the church, but it has to be within the determinate bounds, he says, of dogma, uh, according to the limits of that dogma, keeping the same meaning and the same judgment. 
Now, Vincent is concerned with, um, uh, you know, uh, infallible teaching, you could say. He's concerned with the Christology, um, whereas the, the, the matters, I think, of having to do with uh, religious liberty. So, for instance, the stance uh, from Gregory the 16th, 1816, encyclical Mirari Vos to Vatican II's Dignitati Humani, or from the syllabus of errors of 1864 to Dignitati Humani, um, the question, the way it seems to me, the way that uh, that John Courtney Murray poses that issue, and this is in the introduction, in the the, the Gallagher translation of uh, of the Vatican II documents, he refers, he he says that he's, and I, here I quote him, he says, uh, uh, yes, in any event, the document uh, Dignitas Humani is a significant event in the history of the Church. It was, of course, the most controversial document of the whole Council largely because it raised with sharp emphasis the issue that lay continually below the surface of all the conciliar debates, the issue of development of doctrine. Uh, the notion of development, not the notion of religious freedom, he says, was the real sticking point for many of those who opposed the declaration even to the end. The course of development between the syllabus of errors and dignitatis humani personae still remains to be explained by theologians, but the council formally sanctioned the validity of the development itself, and this was a doctrinal event of high importance for theological thought in many other areas. Now, I agree that, I, well, I would say there's a difference between adaptation, accommodation, Americanism. Uh, I don't think you can put people like, uh, you know, uh, um, Newhouse and, and uh, John, uh, uh, and uh, George Weigel and Michael Novak, I don't think they were accommodationists. Uh, I think they were, they were like Murray, trying to see this matter of religious liberty as a question of doctrinal development, and that that development is organic. Um, I, I would, I've argued elsewhere, and I would just briefly say that, in fact, everything, everything, you know, you have, you have these issues, okay? So, you have to ask the question, does the, does the church's, I, I call it an alteration in her stance on religious liberty, does it represent a change that is a, a permutatio or, or a corruption in her understanding of Christ's lordship and the relationship between freedom and truth? For example, has the, does affirming religious liberty uh, abandon Christ's kingship, as some have suggested? And, and has Christ therefore been uh, um, uncrowned or dethroned as some critics of Vatican II's affirmation of religious liberty held? Uh, uh, chiefly, that's, that phrase is from Archbishop Lefebvre's book. Lefebvre, yes. You know, uh, moreover, does the alteration in, her, in the church's position of religious liberty introduce a doctrinal change, again, a permutatio or corruption in the church's traditional teaching regarding the close connection between freedom and truth? so that freedom undercuts objective truth. Now, I don't think so. I think, I think there's a, an, an argument can be made to show that uh, Christ's kingship has not been abandoned, uh, and hence Christ has not been uncrowned or de dethroned. Um, I think you also have to, in this connection, you have to distinguish between the old Christendom and the new Christendom. The old Christendom is an ecclesiastically unified culture. The new Christendom, it seems to me, is the sanctified laity engaged in the transformation of the world for the sake of Christ. That, that's what it seems to me, Lumen Gentium, chapter uh, four on, on the, the calling of the laity and chapter five, the call to holiness. Uh, and then the, you know, the decree on the apostolate of the laity. Uh, and then later, John Paul II's Christi Fideli Laici. It seems to me the church has not said, the church doesn't embrace religious indifferentism, and hence it doesn't deny Christ's kingship over every aspect of human life. It says explicitly in, in Lumen Gentium that the whole temporal order has to be renewed, restored, redeemed in that sense. Uh, thank you, Professor Echevarria. I, I want to um, move on. I'm sure Dr. Wemhoff wants to 
say something, but uh, before uh, I want to go to uh, Dr. Ureta so that uh, we have uh, now uh, Dr. Wemhoff, that is the thesis, uh, and it seems that Professor Echevarria is the antithesis, and so you are the synthesis if we are following Hegel. And uh, so uh, I want to ask you, what is your comment on what you heard uh, until now? And then uh, I will go back to uh, Dr. Wemhoff for his reply. Uh, thank you for the invitation first, and secondly, unfortunately, I will not be the synthesis because I will side totally on the side of Mr. Wenfo, uh, because I think that indeed there is a change in the formulation. There is a change in the formulation regarding Christ's kingship of a society. He, Christ is not only the king of uh, human souls, of individual persons, he is indeed the king of nations. Um, he received all nations as inheritance. And uh, in the Epiphany, the kings uh, prayed uh, adoration to him and expressing this. And uh, as Professor De Matei says, uh, Jesus not only redeemed men as individuals, but he redeemed them as social beings living in society. So indeed, um, uh, uh, a, a state that doesn't recognize uh, his kingship uh, uh, basically dethrones him. But um, I think the most important aspect uh, in, in the change is regarding um, the, um, the, the very uh, concept of, uh, of, of free, the extension of freedom, so to speak. Uh, Murray says, uh, in the past, we consider that eros don't, ha that don't have uh, any right, but the problem is not that error or, or evil may have right, but just that men have right. And so he said men have the right to follow their own conscience, to search for, for truth by themselves, and the state cannot impose on that. So from that, we have to recognize also the right to express outside these errors, and so the right to propaganda and to open schools and worship and everything else. Now, the great error of uh, Murray and Dignitatis Humanae is to transfer the right of the internal forum to the external forum. The church has always recognized that the internal forum, the man, has a right of, of freedom. No? So no one can be forced to embrace the faith, and a baptist received by force is null and void. No? However, in the external forum, people who embrace the error or practice evil could have their external behavior constrained by the law. No? Um, so like forbidding uh, President Biden to receive communion, no matter what he thinks internally. He is a public sinner, so he cannot receive communion. President Garcia Moreno of Ecuador summarized this very well. He said, freedom to everyone to do everything except for evildoers to do evil. No? Uh, so the reason was given by Pius XII you know, in, when he said that that which does not correspond to truth or not to the norm of morality objectively has no right to exist, to be spread or to be activated, only can be tolerated. You know? So there is no right to immunity in the external forum, as Father Murray and Dignitatis Humanae say. Even in religious matters, religious error could at the most be tolerated. You know? Even modern secular states follow the same principle. You see, two examples. The Jehovah Witness don't accept this is immoral to have blood transfusion. Well, Courts, civil courts, grant permission to hospitals to make blood transfusion to children against the will of their parents, no matter what their religious beliefs are. They don't force them to believe, uh, what the, but they force the children to be saved because objectively, if they don't are transfused, they will die. Another example is, you know, this Sandaimo uh, religion born in Brazil. You know, courts in the Netherlands and in America have uh, forbidden their use of ayahuasca in their rituals. So they are interfering in the external forum on their religion. You know? So this, the church has always made this distinction. So the problem is uh, um, unlawfully to transfer 
the rights of the internal forum into the external forum. Actually, the church, the state is never neutral. We are being now being prosecuted in the names of human rights. They say LGBT people have the right uh, to to ex uh, to have their sexual orientation of the uh, to be transgender. And so uh, you may think whatever you want, the Bible could say whatever you think, but you cannot discriminate against them. So you have to organize their wedding parties in the parish uh, halls, and you have to take pictures and make cakes for them, or uh, in the future will come, you have to accept transgender people in the, in the seminaries, because you cannot, uh, in the external forum, you cannot violate the new secular religion of human rights. So, you see, this distinction is essential, and Murray and Dignitatis Humani doesn't uh, respect it. Thank you, Dr. Ureta. I, of course, I will go now to uh, Dr. Wemhoff. Because, uh, before, I want just to remind you that we are in uh, Ritorno Itaca on YouTube, in my Twitter uh, uh, account, uh, and in Facebook, uh, my fan page. If you want to follow, you can uh, subscribe to my Telegram channel, Aurelio Porfiri, but this program will be also broadcasted on other platforms. Um, now, uh, uh, so Dr. Wemhoff, I have a question for you before, but now uh, I have a little doubt if I ask you this question or let you comment on what uh, the other two persons have said before you, because I'm sure you have many uh, things to say about the the, the previous uh, comments of uh, uh, Professor Echevarria and of Dr. Ureta. So uh, I let you to speak uh, about uh, these things and then I will ask you what I have in mind maybe in the other round, please. Okay, thank you very much. I, I believe I agree with, with both Dr. Areta and Dr. Echevarria um, to, to a very good degree. Um, let, me, um, let me expound on something because I, I didn't really expound on it on, my fir on the first round. And that is while Murray and the Americanists and the Americans wanted a change in Catholic doctrine, they never got it. Uh, Dignitatis Humanae was actually a defeat for the Americans uh, because it clarified the Catholic position. Now, it helps to know Catholic doctrine before you read Dignitatis Humanae, okay? But it did not change Catholic doctrine. And it was very clear at the beginning of, of uh, Dignitatis Humanae, and I throw some quotes out there so, so people have some points of reference, but it's very clear uh, in, in section one, paragraph three, where they say, where the document says, we're not changing the traditional uh, teaching or duty of societies and individuals to the one uh, true church, which is the, the Roman Catholic Church. We're not changing that at all. Um, what Dictatus Humanae also did was to define the common good, which was very helpful, because it said basically it's the sum total of those conditions which help man reach his perfection. Well, what are we talking about perfection? We're talking about beatification. So you have to have a society which builds virtue. That's what the common good is about. And that's defined in chapter one, section six, paragraph one. The public order is the is really a subset of that. And that's in, in uh, 173, chapter one, section seven, paragraph three um, of Dignitatis Humanae. And um, the, the church, um, while this was in a, in, in a geopolitical context, it was also in a theological context because there was a debate in the Catholic um uh, in the Catholic journals, theological journals between Connell and Murray, especially in the 1950s, about what is the society uh, leaders, what are they supposed to follow? And Connell said, you got to follow the divine positive law. Murray argued for the natural law, which is some vague amorphous term, uh, which, which can be misconstrued. And Murray didn't understand or he didn't properly pronounced the natural law. Anyways, every society has got to follow the divine positive law. That is set forth in Dignitatis Humanae. Um, it's, it's chapter one, section three, paragraph one. And it's also set forth in Intermerifica, in Intermerifica, which came out in December of 1963, which, which in paragraph six is a formal decree of the council saying that that society, every society is bound by the moral order, which means the eternal law, which is the basis. Um, and Dignitas Amani says you can restrict so-called religious liberty if it interferes with the common good and the public order. So if it does harm 
people's souls, you can restrict it. You don't have an unrestricted right to do what you want to do. The Catechism of the Catholic Church reiterates these principles. In section 2105, it talks really about the social kingship of Christ. Jesus Christ is still the king of every society. In sections 2108 and 2109, it says religious liberty is not the right to error. Religious liberty, it says, can be restrained and not just by some positivistic, quote unquote, public order. Okay, so, uh, of course, in the catechism, again, you have the definition of the common good uh, in section 1906 through 1912. And in the catechism, again, you have this idea of society is supposed to build virtue in section 1895. And again, in the catechism, section 1950 through 1953, law has got to be based on the moral order. Every society has got to follow that. What the Americans did is they had the media, they had the press, and they got the Catholic leadership. And I dare say to include the current pope to agree that the American system of social organization of separation of church and state is absolutely fine and acceptable. And that is the problem uh, that you're dealing with. You're dealing with a situation where the leadership believes that religious liberty is the way to go American style, but not religious liberty, the Catholic style. So they've stopped trying to convert people. Oh, thank you very much. And uh, I know that uh, uh, before going to uh, Professor Echevarria, so I will now uh, ask uh, Dr. Rueda, because I know that he wants to uh, react on what uh, Dr. Wemhoff has said, and then I will go to Professor Echevarria. Dr. Rueda, uh, the microphone. Yes, um, the question is that Dignitatis Humane um, is t is, uh, states that the limit of the right to uh, religious freedom is not the common good. Uh, it says that only one of its aspects, which is public order. No, this was clearly strengthened by Bishop Desmet, who was the rapporteur during the council about this, who declared explicitly in the report of November 19, 1965, and he says that Common good is the norm when the safeguard or promotion of religious freedom is at stake. So only to promote religious freedom. But when it comes to its limitations, only its fundamental part, that is to say public order, is considered because it is the expression used in modern civil codes. And here is a big departure from Catholic doctrine. No, big departure. So precisely they make this distinction no, um, where they put public order, uh, I don't know how many times, and common good only one, and making this restriction, common or uh, the common good is um, expressed only to safeguard religious freedom, while the rest is public order. So if the Satanist uh, uh, cult in America ask for permission to do Satanist catechism in the schools, no, and this doesn't disturb public order in any way, should be allowed. That is the consequence of dignitatis humana. Uh, thank you. Uh, I, I want to ask uh, Professor Ureta something, because I also have uh, my big reservation about this idea of religious freedom in this sense. So, of course, I know that uh, no one has to be forced to believe on something and is okay but uh, we as catholics say uh, uh, following what uh, jesus say you know that uh, he is the truth life and resurrection he is the truth so if he's the truth it means uh, the other cannot be the truth because if not we will have two uh, two absolute truth that is something that is not possible mm -hmm. so it's also um, uh, understandable that we have to tolerate you know that other people have other belief but one thing is to tolerate and another is to promote and also how you reconcile your catholic belief what what pope francis say for example in abu dhabi uh, with the declaration on religion where he say that the difference of religions uh, is something that god uh, has uh, has uh, done or how, how is possible that we mm -hmm. I, i'm sorry i i hope you understand what is my yes 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 uh, well uh, I, uh, the, the professor echevarria and then uh, dr oh, Rita, sorry sorry yes. well uh 
I, I've written so much about that, about uh, the, the church does not teach uh, that religious diversity is, uh, you know, God's will. Uh, it seems to me that that's, uh, if, if, and I don't think, and I certainly don't think that, uh, uh, that Lumen Gentium and, uh, and uh, Dignitatis Humani, or, or for that matter, any document of the Second Vatican Council teaches that all religions are, because it, 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 that kind of view, of course, or as expressed, whether rightly or wrongly, uh, whether that's what the Pope intended to say, um, you know, it does support religious relativism. All religions are equally vehicles of salvation. They're equally true. It supports a relativism about truth. I think it also supports a, a sort of a subjectivist religious epistemology and in the end, the privatization of Christianity. I do not believe that, uh, uh, and I think it can be argued textually from uh, Vatican Lumen Gentium and other documents, the church is not arguing for the privatization of religion. What, what, uh, what uh, uh, Jose said earlier, uh, and citing uh, uh, the, the Catholic historian, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the Lumen Gentium does not privatize Christianity. It doesn't say that uh, Christ is just Lord over your uh, personal life. I mean, there, it, it's very clear that uh, it's an, and it's explicitly stated, as I said in, my, in the first round, that uh, Christ uh, is uh, about the renewal of the whole temporal order. It says every aspect of life, every every domain, uh, and and in fact, just just to give a quick. Um, it says, therefore, this is in paragraph 36 of Lumen Gentium, uh, there, would be, there would be no need to say this, uh, and, and hence there would be no need to have the decree on the, the apostolate of the laity, uh, and then John Paul II's uh, Christi Fideli Laici and other documents of the church, if in fact uh, Christ's lordship or kingship was just a private matter or a personal matter. No, it's the whole temporal order, it says. Therefore, by their competence in secular fields and by their personal activity elevated from within by the grace of Christ. So gra grace renews nature from within. The, the nature, the structures of reality. Why would the church argue for uh, its understanding of marriage uh, uh, if in fact it was... Uh, it, 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 marriage is not a private matter. It, yes, it's a personal matter, but it, but but marriage is also a social good. Let them labor vigorously, it says, so that by human labor, technical skill, and civic culture, created goods may be perfected for the benefit of every last man, according to the design of the Creator and the light of His Word. Let them work to see that created goods are more fittingly distributed among men and that such goods in their own way lead to general progress in human and Christian liberty. In this manner, through the members of the church, Christ will progressively illumine the whole of human society with his saving light. Uh, by so doing, it says, lay men will imbue culture and human activity with moral values. They will better prepare the field of the world for the seed of the word of God. At the same time, they will open wide of the church doors through which the message of peace can enter the world. So, that's my, my that's my first uh, objection to to what uh, uh, to what Jose was saying that, uh, and and the kingship of Christ of course the church doesn't teach that it's that it's a, a, only a personal matter that, you know as if it's only the soul that needs to be saved the whole temporal order needs to be redeemed renewed restored to its proper ends uh, divine ends and so on uh, the other thing is, and there I agree with uh, with uh, uh, Wemhoff, David, and that is that, um, and we can discuss the te you know the, the text itself of of Dignitas Humani. I don't think I don't think it can be argued that uh, that uh, religious freedom in that text means anything goes. That you're free to do you you you, you that you're free. Uh, 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 
you know, to exercise religious liberty in any any way you want. Now, of course, it has been interpreted that way by by our society, by our culture, where people think, you know, even uh, the, the the Satanist. Um, I mean, I think I think there there has to be error has no rights. Error has no rights. Dignitatis humani doesn't dis, doesn't deny that. Uh, it's people who have rights because we live in a the terms of our society, and we can try to change those terms. But a term we live in a in a pluralistic society, a religiously pluralistic and even a morally pluralistic one. And in that context, I think maybe 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 uh, maybe the document is too naive. It assumes that maybe it assumes that there was a forum where we could have you know, public conversations about these matters in order to bring about uh, a transformation of culture, you know. Uh, well, that clearly is not happening in our culture because not only is there an escape from reason, but uh, 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 but even, even, you know, free speech is being squashed. Huh? So it, it could very well be the case when this was written, the culture was such that people assumed that there was a forum where there could, where the sanctified laity could be involved in the transformation of culture by arguments, uh, reason, evidence, and all of that. And obviously, we live in a culture now where you can't, you can't say there's not much that you can say, you know, where you're not going to get uh, quote unquote canceled. Uh, so the other thing I want to say, and then I'll stop, and that is it's important for me philosophically to distinguish uh, the conditions that make something true, which is reality. Clearly, the clearly uh, Dignitatis Humani affirms the objective truth, universal validity of the Christian faith. You have to distinguish the conditions that make something true. The church has a, it stands in a realist tradition where a proposition is going to be true if what it asserts is in fact the case about objective reality from the conditions under which I come to know that something is true. Um, so the conditions under which I come to know something is true is going to have to include that you come to, uh, through reason, freely come to know that something is true. My knowing it doesn't make it true. Uh, even my freely knowing it doesn't make it true. Um, so that's. I mean, it seems to me that uh, I'm. I'm. I'm I, I, I would say I'm more with David Wemhoff than than the way that uh, that Jose in, interprets it because I just don't think that uh, even if it's obviously been appropriated in such a way where people think that uh, you know. You, you should be free to do whatever you want, and that that somehow is what uh, you know the, the 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 what the document is saying, or what I don't believe that that's what uh, you know uh, John Courtney Murray thought. Uh, but certainly, in in a contemporary context, you can see how that's been distorted in such a way where freedom becomes an absolute. You create your own values. Uh, you, in fact, there there are no constraints, not even the constraint of nature, biology. You you if you think you're a girl and you have a uh, you know a penis, uh, you know the body is irrelevant. Biology is irrelevant, and so so John Paul II talks about this. And uh, uh, thank in, you, because yeah. I want to uh, to to have a, a, a fast uh, reaction from. Uh, uh, Dr. Rureta, and uh, before that, uh, I want to um, show something that I think uh, it would be useful uh, in this context. And what I want to show is uh, this uh, passage from the declaration in Abu Dhabi, where the, the, the Pope and other religious leaders say, freedom is a right of every person. Each individual enjoys the freedom of belief, thought, expression, and action. The pluralism and the diversity of religions, color, sex, race, and language are willed by God in his wisdom. Through 
which he created human beings. So this is what he said on this document. And I also want to say that when we talk about the before uh, Professor Echevarria say we live in a pluralistic, pluralistic society, but this is a more a very American view uh, because indeed we uh, we uh, uh, European especially before we didn't live in a pluralistic society, but in societies that were mostly Catholic, and then they became pluralistic for the influence also or some mistakes that come from. Uh, uh, I'm sorry to say, from the United States uh, with uh, through the Americanistic heresy. But uh, I, I want to uh, have a first uh, reaction from Dr. Ureta, and then I go to Dr. Wemhoff. Please. Yes. Um, first, uh, I, I'm not saying that Dignitatis Humanis is the same as Pope Francis. Pope Francis embraces the agnostic form of liberalism. Um, where there are no objective truths and values, and so God uh, uh, is in God's will the diversity of religions. That is uh, basically the Enlightenment's vision of uh, religious freedom. Dignitatis Humanae is different. Is the Catholic liberalism, uh, which was precisely what was condemned by Mirari Vos and Quantacura. We can return to that uh, later on. No? which is a moderate form of it, saying that basically um, the um, uh, other religions has a right to exist, not only be tolerated. No. Now, um, uh, Dr. Echeverria says anything goes. Well, according to Dignitatis Humanae, uh, there are some limits, public order. Which are the limits? Bishop Desmet again, the rapporteur, mentioned which are the limits of public order. The limits are the infringement of other people's rights. So you cannot uh, step on the rights of other people. Second, disturbances of public peace. So you promote a riot, no, obviously. And attack to public morality. So you, the only little thing that could prevent on, on that side is this attack to public morality. But the problem is, the cons who is the one who will define which is the public morality? Is the state itself. So now, if you, for instance, make a, a rally against LGBT, you will be the one who will be attacking public morality today, no? because it becomes relativistic. No? Uh, now, about the idea that um, uh, Christ is still the king. But, uh, Professor Echeverria himself says that we are a new Christianity. It's not the no, previous Christianity. Say, I'm sorry, I didn't say a new You said new Christianity. A new Christendom. In, well, that's a new a, Christendom, a, exactly. A new, a new Christendom, Christendom, in that sense. It's not yeah, a, in that sense. In that sense. Well, what is the difference? The previous Christendom was institutional Christendom, where the state was united to the church and wrong religions were only tolerated. The new Christendom is a Christendom where Christianity is only vital, a vital element of society, but the state itself is not confessional. No, at least in this sense, that it does not uh, prevent other religions to exist and to expand, etc. That is uh, explicitly stated in Dignitatis Humanae, where it says some religion, Catholic religion could give a privileged status, but this privileged status cannot prevent other religions the, to have the right of existence and propaganda, etc. No? So, uh, and finally, pluralistic. We live in a pluralistic society. I mean, unfortunately, you know, the, here in France, it is says that the French army it's, is always one war behind. Uh, the, 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 this uh, story of the submarines in Australia is one more proof of that. Anyway, uh, modernists in the church, liberals in the church are always one uh, war behind because when they proclaim dignitatis humanae and, and embraced uh, religious freedom, still a Western society had some, uh, respected the same values of the natural order. 
today, these natural values are not respected anymore. They don't believe in nature. You can change your sex, no? So there is no nature. Uh, you, you are what you want to be, no? So now, we don't live anymore in a pluralistic society. We live in a dictatorship of relativism, as Pope Benedict XVI said. So when they embraced uh, religious freedom, religious freedom was escaping you know, from uh, even this tolerant, Girondine form of religious freedom was already giving uh, way to a Jacobine form of uh, not religious freedom. Thank you. Uh, I saw. Uh, I saw. I know that, of course, Professor Echevarria want to say many things. But before I want to go to Dr. Wemhoff because his name was mentioned many times, and I'm sure he has some comments to make on what was said before. Please. Um, yes. Thank you very much. I, you know, I, I agree with um, some of the things that Dr. Reda says and some of the things Dr. Echevarria say. I, I think the one aspect, though, of, of dignitas humanae that you just can't get around is right there in the first uh, uh, the first section, paragraph three, where it says um, the sacred council likewise proclaim um, uh, that these obligations bind man's conscience. Religious freedom um, leaves intact the traditional Catholic teaching on the moral duty of individuals and societies towards the true religion and the one church of Christ. End of quote. So, so that's an introductory statement there. Dignitas Humanae says, we're not going to change the doctrine. We're going to keep the doctrine the same. And in fact, you know, this was part of the big discussion uh, between Connell and Murray in the 40s and 50s and the 60s. Connell said uh, the traditional doctrine says you're supposed to have the confessional state because exactly. uh, you're supposed to follow the divine positive law of Jesus Christ. And that requirement of the confessional state arises from the divine positive law of Jesus Christ. That's the Sermon on the Mount, really, where Jesus comes and says, I, I came not to destroy the law and the prophets, but to fulfill them. And what did the law and the prophets do? They told people how to live. Exactly. They told the governing authorities how to, how to govern their society. So Jesus is saying, hey, you got to follow me. And, and that's the idea. Now, what happened in the 1950s, my book talks about it, is the Holy Office understood that there was this struggle going on. And so people were saying, well, in a democracy, all you got to do, like a democracy like America, all you got to do is give people freedom and everything will be fine. And the Holy Office sent out four secret erroneous propositions in October 1954, and it went to Connell uh, and Fenton. And they said, um, no, um, it is an error to say all you do is guarantee religious liberty. You, you have to actually follow the divine positive law. This was an issue that mm -hmm. Connell sent to Rome in July of 59. And that issue, I, I submit to you, is what is actually uh, contained in Dignitatis Humanae when they talk about uh, chapter one, section three, paragraph one, about the eternal law as being the model of human behavior. And then also to the moral order in, in Intermerifica, paragraph six, the council fathers were shrewdy wooties. They snuck this one in because the American media was beating the heck out of them and they got tired of it. And they said, you guys got to follow the moral order. And then you got paragraph 12 of Intermerifica, which also tells the government's got to be involved in the right culture, which is the common good. I, I think Professor Rita and I have a different read on, on uh, chapter one, section seven. And, and I would submit to you that um, that chapter one, section seven, paragraph two, uh, really has the common good uh, as the general modifier of religious liberty too. And it does go into the whole issue of public or order. You're, ab you're absolutely right. It does talk about public order, but I think in a general sense, the common good can limit religious liberty. Murray was definitely a fan of the public order argument. He said, all you got to do is keep enough order so society can work. In other words, keep enough order so business can function and the plutocracy can run. And that, that's where, where I disagree perhaps with some people. What you have in America with, with the First Amendment and with the ideology underlying the creation of this society is really a system that allows for a plutocracy. I think it began with, with Locke. And John Locke was picked out of the dirt you know, by Lord Ashley and he said, hey, come up with some ideas that we can use, you know, to keep control because the plutocrats, the wealthy, powerful entrepreneurs have always been afraid of three things. I've said this before in your program, uh, a strong, independent government, a strong, independent church and a mob that realized they just got screwed and they're going to they're going to hang the bad guys. 
Okay, so those are the three things that they're afraid of. And the First Amendment, in large measure in its totality, permits uh, that protection. That's why Murray wanted sanctification of the American political system, which dignitas humani does not approve, does not approve that in my view. And also, too, the catechism does not approve. I think that's the extent of what I have to say, Dr. Uh, Profiri. Yes, th this is, the, I think, uh, what you were mentioning. It's Chapter 7, uh, Paragraph 2, I put on the screen uh, so that uh, everyone can uh, see and read uh, the, the, the passage that you were uh, mentioning. And uh, I think that uh, at this point, uh, maybe um, uh, Dr. Ureta want to say something uh, because he was... Uh, mentioned and then uh, of, uh, of course I will go to uh, Professor Echevarria for his comments. So Dr. Rudeta, please. Yes, uh, effectively Dignitatis Humanae uh, recognize the duty of persons and societies to search for the truth. And um, But uh, again, this is the, the, the problem I, I mentioned at the very beginning. A, a distinction between the moral freedom, the internal moral freedom in the internal forum to search for the truth, and then another thing is the external freedom to practice what you believe or to make propaganda of what you, you believe. No. So uh, the, the, the change is that in the past, no, uh, in, in Christendom, Oh, uh, error and heretic sects, etc., were only tolerated. In the new concept, it's not that they are tolerated. They had a right to uh, to exist and to 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 do what, what they believe. So the role of the coercive action of the state consists in safeguarding religious freedom from any violation. In this in respect, as they said, common good, but never to restrict religious freedom in the name of the common good. Bishop De Smet said this very clearly. No, it's only the, a, an aspect of it, it which is public order. No? And that is the main difference between the traditional view and the new, which is a rupture. It, it is, there is clearly a change no? uh, on, on, on this. Thank you, uh, Professor Echevarria. Well, I think that, uh, again, uh, David Wenhoff, it seems to me, is, is right that if we read clearly, if we read uh, paragraph three, uh, where, in, so it's part of the introduction, where it says that uh, the highest norm of human life is the divine law eternal objective and universal whereby God orders, directs and governs the entire universe and all the ways of the human community by a plan conceived in wisdom and love. Man has been made by God to participate in this law. That's what the, the natural law is as traditionally understood is human participation in, in the eternal law of God with the result that under the gentle disposition of divine providence, he can come to perceive ever increasingly the unchanging truth Hence, every man has the duty and therefore the right to seek the truth in matters religious in order that he may, with prudum, prudence, form for himself right and true judgments of conscience with the use of all suitable means. Now, it seems to me that uh, if later on, even when it talks in, in paragraph seven about the right to religious freedom is exercised in human society um, and, and the... the that's articulated in the in the in that paragraph in the following paragraph it then goes on to say that society has the right to defend itself against possible abuses committed on pretext of freedom of religion uh, the and then it says its action is to be controlled by juridical norms which are in conformity with the objective moral order so it doesn't seem to me that it's just a matter of uh maintaining public order uh, in fact in the in the footnotes to the edition of vatican ii that i have it says that the requirements of public order are not subject to arbitrary definition the public order of society is a part of the universal moral order because that's what in fact it says in paragraph three that the highest norm of human life is the divine law now of course it's very easy to show that the, that that 
the contemporary church, as it were, um, I mean, if you, again, I've, I've written about this. If you, you know, you, if you read, you know, the Cardinal Archbishop of Chicago, uh, Supich and others, they don't understand, they either don't understand this or they've rejected it because they've in fact made conscience something uh, autonomous and self-sufficient, you see. And that's not just only with respect to the, the cultural and social order, but also with respect to individual life. I mean, hence the whole, the, the business about uh, homosexuality and et cetera, et cetera. I think this document is better, is better than the, than the way it's been interpreted uh, and the way, yeah, the, the collapse of, you know, we lived in a culture that, uh, not that everybody was a Christian, but that there was a certain, uh, a certain acceptance of Christian norms, as it were, even regarding, you know, uh, unborn life. I mean, that's no longer the case. And even regarding marriage, and that's, of course, no longer the case. So uh, it seems to me, if we were, if the, if the church, and unfortunately, I don't think Pope Francis understands that either, uh, if the church understood this, it would actually be engaged in doing what uh, 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 Vatican II says in Lumen Gentium, in the, in the decree on the apostle of laity, and, and so on and so on. And that is that we have to, that, that the church, the sanctified laity, has to be engaged in the transformation of culture uh, for the sake of Christ, for the sake of Christian principles, for the sake of conformity with the objective moral order, because ultimately, as it says, the highest norm of human life is the divine law, which is eternal, objective, and human and universal. That's the way God orders, directs, and governs the entire universe, the whole human community. And so we, we, we would need then to be engaged in uh, uh, not just evangelizing in the sense of evangelizing individuals, but in the in uh, in cultural discipleship, as it were, so that we could actually, um, you know, be engaged, as the council said, in the transformation of the whole of the whole temporal order. This is, it seems to me, what uh, you know, ca ca American Catholics like Robert George and and uh, and George Weigel and the late uh, Newhouse and Michael Novak. They, all, I think, they understood all this. And they didn't, and of course, they didn't privatize Christianity. They didn't make it a personal matter. Uh, Christianity is about public truth. And so, you know, I, I used to say to people, uh, the American press, they liked John Paul II, uh, but they said, why does he insist about talk, talking about Christ in public? Um, if you... If you compare, this is my last point, if you compare when, when Francis came to the United States and talked at the United Nations, and you, if you compare what Francis said with what Benedict said, with what John Paul II said, and even with what Paul VI said, Christ, it's like St. Paul on Mars Hill in the Oropagus. He, they all, John Paul, Pope Paul VI, John Paul II, Benedict, they all talked about Christ. Ben, uh, Francis didn't. And I, I, I think that that's, uh, that is, it seems to me that that's uh, utterly mistaken. Uh, he has a, who am I? I'm not the Pope, but he has a completely wrong understanding of uh you know, the uh, Lumen Gentium and religious liberty. And of course that quote, you know, that that business about religious diversity being part of the will of God, that's just utter, that's just not true. It's certainly not the teaching of the church. Thank you. It, it seems that uh, from what you say, we go from liberty of religions uh, uh, to liberty from religions. Uh, that that's is, uh, yes, that's uh, I, I think, uh, 
the the process. Uh, I, I want to we we got to, uh, toward the end, uh, and I want to introduce uh, a last point because I was very curious with Dr. Wemhoff, and then uh, if you want to comment too, uh, Dr. Wemhoff, Wemhoff, as I say, wrote this book called uh, John Curtin in Murray Time Life and the American Proposition: How the CIA's doctrinal warfare program changed the Catholic Church. So I'm very curious about the CIA. Uh, uh, CIA doctrinal warfare program. Uh, well, if you can uh, really synthesize uh, for us a little what uh, you discovered, of course, uh, if people want to know more, I have to read the, your 1,000, almost 1,000 pages book. But can you uh, summarize for us and then maybe the other guests can comment on what you say? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Just, just very briefly, uh, something Dr. Escheveria said. And, and I'm finding myself agreeing with both Dr. Echevarria and Dr. Rita on, on certain points. But what Dr. Echevarria said is about th th this issue of, of people uh, being part of this um, uh, democratic society. You're supposed to live your faith. And that's indignitatis humanae. <laughs> that's clearly indignitatis humanae. It is, um, oh, I just had it. Uh, Dignitas chapter two, section 10. You're supposed to give full expression of the Roman Catholic faith in your life. So Joe Biden, I know he's going to watch this. You know, he's supposed to be following that and be standing up against abortion. He's supposed to be doing that. And that was part of the discussion in 1960 during the Kennedy presidential campaign. And the Catholic bishops just backed off of it, which brings me to my next point, which is that a lot of the Catholic leadership, the Catholic bishops believe in the American system of social organization. They don't believe in their own doctrine, like Dr. Echevarria said. A lot of them just don't believe it anymore. And that, that is ultimately the problem. So, OK, so the CIA and the Catholic Church. In the United States, you have three, a troika, which basically runs a society. You got the powerful business interests, usually financial capitalists. You got the media, once again, protected by the First Amendment. And then the third thing you got are the intelligence agencies. And the CIA is, is chief among the intelligence agencies. During the course of my research, I got declassified a 1953 document called uh, Doctrinal Warfare, PSB D33. It was issued under the guardianship or guidance, guidance, if you will, of Edward Lilly, Dr. Edward Lilly, a Catholic uh, who sought ways to get the Catholic Church to advance the American ideology. That, that document, Annex B, had certain requirements of the CIA, which was to infiltrate uh, organizations and to promote heresies. By 1961, Monsignor Fenton was saying, it's very clear Catholic doctrine is under assault all around the world. What the CIA did is they funded a guy called uh, Father Morleone, uh, Felix Morleone, who was the founder of Prodeo University. Prodeo University taught the young, um, young Catholic business leaders, especially from the Latin countries, that the American system of social organization is the ideal and that they should do what Professor Reda said, that they should just simply go along with the American system and that's the best way to go. And that is that is what the CIA did in a major sense. I couldn't find any evidence Murray was with the CIA, but the CIA regularly came over to Time Magazine and asked for their files and, and, and the Time Magazine gave the files to the CIA and there was talking back and forth. It's a uh, comfortable relationship, I suppose, between the two that probably persists in large measure to this day uh, with other organs of, of social communication. Thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Ureta. Yes, I would like to make a, a short comment just to make the difference between the previous to uh, Vatican II and after Vatican II. I think if, you, if we take a historical uh, case, Will uh, people will understand better? In the fourth century, no, there was in Rome, in Curia Julia, the altar of victory, no, placed by Augustus on the day of his return from Egypt, no? and uh, the Senate uh, burned grains of incense to the emperor there. Now, when Emperor Gratian ordered his removal, no? so the head of the pagan religion, no. Um, he, Simacus, he tried to uh, avoid that, no? And then Valentinian II uh, kept it, etc. And f finally, he, this Simacus, wrote uh, two letters, no? Asking for the freedom to continue to publicly celebrate their cult, the, the pagan cult to the emperor, no? Um, and then, 
if uh, uh, traditional Catholic would be placed in this uh, case, will say, no, you cannot. Dignitatis Humanae will say, well, the pagan religion has the right to uh, worship their uh, gods, so we have to allow it. And we'll recommend the emperor to allow the altar of victory to be replaced. No. Now, what did St. Ambrose answer? This is from St. Ambrose answer to Symmachus. He says, you profess relativists because you do not believe in the existence of one true God. Yet, you harshly persecuted us, showing yourself extremely inconsistent with your relativism. Today, you ask us to be inconsistent because we Christians, unlike you, do not believe in the quality of religions, but in the absolute truth of the Christian religion. We did not deny him yesterday facing martyrdom. Today, we would cease to testify to the truth if we accepted your principle of religious freedom. And so the emperor didn't replace the altar of victory. So here you see a, a clear difference between the traditional teaching of the church and the new teaching of the church where they will replace the altar of victory for the pagans to worship their God. Thank you, Dr. Loretta. Uh, I, I leave the last uh, short comment to Professor Echevarria. Uh, Professor Echevarria, so uh, I leave you for your ecumenical uh, comment so that uh, we'll, uh, we'll <laughs> please everyone, hopefully. Thank you. Well, uh, just... Just to one final comment, I mean, the fact is, if even I, I've neglected to mention Gaudium et Spes, but Gaudium et Spes in paragraph 43 rejects the complementalization of faith and life. It says, uh, this split between the faith which many profess in their daily lives deserves to be counted among the more serious errors of our age. Therefore, let there be no false opposition, it says, between professional and social activities on the one part and religious life on the other. The Christian who neglects his temporal duties, neglects his duties towards his neighbor, and even God and jeopardizes his eternal salvation uh, in the exercise of all their earthly activities. This is, again, just the whole point that the Christian, in the, in the, mind, of the, in the mind of these documents, in the mind of the Second Vatican Council, is engaged in the whole of life. And it's not just... Uh, restoring the vitality of the culture or, or strengthening the vitality of the culture in the light of Christian principles, but it's really applying those Christian principles. Now, as I said already, I don't think many in the church understand this. And when I say many, as I, even bishops and archbishops and, and even in my humble, I'm not, you know, estimation, even the Pope doesn't understand this. Because you have to be engaged, you have to be engaged in the transformation of the whole culture, the whole spectrum of culture. May I ask you something? Yes. The, this clearly applies to individual Christians. Does it apply to the state? The state should proclaim this and be confessional. Okay. I think it applies to the state insofar as you want to argue like when you can argue against, you know, when in, in 2015, when the when the court, the Supreme Court was uh, considering the matter of uh, the, the legalization of same sex marriage. Or I think you can appeal to the state. You can appeal to you know your congressmen, your senators. You you can engage there in uh, in an attempt to show them that that, you know, that marriage is the two and one flesh union of a man and a woman, as it has always been understood, not just by Christians, but cross-culturally. So I don't see any reason why, why it doesn't apply to the state. And should uh, it go to the extent of forbidding one religion? Well, no, I don't. I don't. I don't think it can go. No, I don't think it can go to the extent of forbidding a religion. I think that is the difference between the traditional well, yeah, teaching the and the new is, teaching. Okay. No. No, you're assuming that. I don't think that's no. true. I, I think, in, I, I, think in the, I think money. I think the question is whether that is a, a a change such that the the church's traditional teaching has been completely uh, corrupted, or whether it's a development such that 
the, the to the, say the opposite of said before. The opposite of what? Of, of what the church said before. Well, yeah. So then, so then it seems to me that's what has to be argued. I think that everything um, that that uh, Mirari Voss, for instance, rejected as far as religious indifferentism, as far as a kind of a subjectivist epistemology, mm. or 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 uh, the privatization of Christianity, uh, the Dignitatis Humani still rejects that. Yes, it but it, it doesn't reject the other part of Mirari Bas and Quanta Cura, which is the contention of liberal Catholics that r r other religions has a right to exist. But that's a de facto and claim. That is, and that is, what, uh, that is what Mirari Bas and Quanta Cura okay, expressly the condemned. Question, the question is whether, whether, whether changing that, uh, because the conditions have changed, whether that brings about a fundamental corruption of the church's teaching. Yeah. I don't think so. I think that everything that matters in the end that was rejected by Mirari Voss, uh, uh, chief of which is the, the, the matter of religious indifferentism, subjectivism, mm -hmm. not only that, the of Christianity, it, all of that, that that's it, still rejected by... It was against liberal Catholics, not against agnostics. Uh, okay, so... And in the same with Pantacura. It all depends on what we understand by liberal Catholicism. Uh -huh. I, I don't con I don't consider uh, Lamennais Montalembert. Uh, yeah, yeah. What but I'm they they defended the idea that the yeah. new state, a neutral state, has to be accepted by the Catholic Church. Well, this idea was condemned by uh, Quantacura and Miraribos. Right. So, but the state is I don't I don't consider the state neutral no more than I consider. You know, I often that, say this, it doesn't so, exist. It doesn't, oh, it doesn't exist. exist. Sorry, course. sorry, I, I, because I know that uh, Dr. Wemhoff wants to say something about yeah. the state. So I, let, let us uh, uh, listen what he wants to say so that he can contribute to your debate, please. Oh, this is a great discussion. I'm really enjoying this. I, I want to thank both of you gentlemen and thank you, Dr. Porfiri. Yeah, ab absolutely. The state has an obligation to the one true religion to protect and defend it. Absolutely, it does. And the problem with the American system is it says, oh, there's a wall of separation. And you have Lawrence versus Texas that came out in 2003 where the U.S. Supreme Court said, oh, no, you can't base any laws on, on, on a moral theology. I mean, that cuts to the heart of Catholic doctrine. So now you have a structure in America which is very clearly not in accordance with Catholic doctrine. So uh, the church can definitely, I mean, I'm sorry, the state can definitely act to protect the church to defend the church. It's supposed to. It's required to do that. It's supposed to base its policies and its and its its laws and its rulings on the Catholic religion. And if these other religions are a threat to the morality and to the safety of the Catholic people, it can restrict them to the point of uh, squelching so, them, I would say. If I may just quickly just mo so the okay. question is whether the sanctified laity uh, can make a case for that. I mean, when I read someone like uh, Robert George, you know, defending uh, and Patrick Lee defending, you know, con conjugal union, defending the traditional view of marriage and all that. And they're trying to uh, or even matters of, uh, you know, the dignity of unborn human life. I mean, they're, they're trying to do that and they're yeah. trying to get the state to 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 recognize yeah. that, you see. So it's yeah. not I don't think it's a question of uh, uh I, I don't think that I, as I say, I think you know the 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 Bidens of this world. They don't understand that they've privatized right. Christianity, right. so they don't I, understand. I agree. I agree. And that's they, not, that's not uh, you. You can't find that in the Second Vatican Council. No, I I, I completely agree with you. We're we're in agreement on that. There was this idea that we have this new society. It's a democratic society, and we just make people act. Christian and they act on that Christianity, they act on their basis and they can change society. Yeah, but but you got to reject the people like Biden's and you got to have the church leadership accept that. And they have to work at unquestionably and they have to work. You got to reject Biden. <laughs> that's right. And they have to work towards the proper organization of society where what Dr. Arita says is not codified or protected in law, like it I call it law, like it is now. 
that has to be thrown out. The liberal view of social social organization has to be thrown out. But if you're a Catholic and you advance that, and you're a Catholic leader and you advance that viewpoint that I'm talking about, the traditional Catholic teaching, you're going to see your career suffer. Okay. Well, yeah, and, of course, and you're, of and you're going to be marginalized. Believe of me. course you so, are. Of course, Thank you. this is a great discussion. Thank Thanks. you. Uh, uh, I don't know if uh, uh, Dr. Rureta want to uh, have one minute. Uh, just, just, just one last comment. In the 19th yeah. century, the discussion was that the ideal uh, confessional state was the thesis, but we have to accept the hypothesis of the new secular state. No? Now, the hypothesis became the thesis through dignitatis humani. Now we defend a neutral state. You know? The same thing happened now, is happening now with marriage. You know? In the past, obviously, never accepted that adultery you know, will be accepted. But today, you know, they say to us, uh, marriage is the ideal, is the thesis. But we have to accept that people are not living in their condition and we have got to accept them. You know? But then in the future, the hypothesis will become the thesis. No? So we will accept uh, uh, clearly uh, adultery. No? So this is the slippery slope on, uh, uh, where uh, all these doctrines pass. No? So in the case, Dignitatis Humanae was the intermediate state to Pope Francis' declaration in Abu Dhabi. Pope Francis doesn't understand Dignitatis Humanae. He said that he is developing it. Well... But the, there's a difference between development and change, and he's well, but, uh, he will say he, he he will quote some Vincent of Lerins. No, yeah, but he doesn't uh, understand yeah. Vincent. He, he actually did it. Has he quoted John of Paris yet? You think? Yeah. <laughs> So uh, thank you very much, uh, and I, I can see that uh, we we can go on for uh, other two hours. I, I want to uh, say to our viewers that uh, next Thursday we have this program uh, in Italian. I confini del sacro, religione, magia, esoterismo is about religion, uh, magic, and ex esoterism, and what is the relationship. Uh, uh, among this dimension so will be a very interesting program in English we will have on Friday liturgical movement between two centuries the good the bad and the ugly and we will discuss about the dark the dark side of the liturgical movement and then uh, uh, of course we will have uh, uh, the guest we have tonight uh, as a guest in the near future as I hope uh, I know I will have Dr. Ureta uh, in November 5 I think when we will discuss about a very interesting topic that is uh, the Cetus Internationalis Patrum during Vatican II uh, do you, you know that Dr. Ureta is Uh, uh, is a member of uh, tradition family property that is uh, an international association mm -hmm. and that was founded by Dr. Plinio Corredo Oliveira and that Dr. Plinio Corredo Oliveira has a very important role during uh, the Second Vatican Council. So we will discuss uh, with uh, Dr. Ureta, we will discuss with uh, Dr. Uh, um, uh, uh, Now, I don't remember the name, uh, Dr. Um, uh, what's the name? Uh, okay, uh, sorry, I have a little uh, blank moment. Uh, and uh, we will discuss uh, with uh, uh, Bishop Athanasius Schneider. Uh, and then we will have uh, certainly uh, other guests. Uh, so uh, uh, the, that was uh, Dr. Loredo. Sorry, uh, I have a, a little uh, a moment of uh, <laughs> blanking because I have so many names in my, in my mind that uh, uh, sometimes I don't remember everyone. So, uh, but, so this is, will be on November 5th, but I want to also remind that on the end of October, we will have two very important programs. On October 28th, we will discuss about Catholic modernism. Uh, this will be a program in Italian. And the day, um, the following day, October 29, we will have a program in English where we will discuss about one of the main modernists, that is Alfred Loisy. And we will have guests from the United States, from other countries to discuss about this very important uh, modernist, Alfred Loisy, October 29. So uh, saying all of this, I want to thank uh, Dr. David A. Wemhoff. I want to thank, thank Professor you. Eduardo Echevarria.
and I want to thank uh, Dr. Jose Antonio Ureta for this very living, uh, um, lively discussion. And uh, I, I hope that everyone will enjoy it as I have enjoyed it myself uh, personally. So thank you very much. Thank and you. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Take care. Take care. Thank, thank you very much. Bye. Bye-bye.